Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Merceron uh, here at Tri-City Baptist Church. I am very uh, thankful for the opportunity that Pastor has given me to uh, preach here behind this pulpit. And um, if you're watching online, take your Bibles, and we're going to turn to Matthew, the book of Matthew. Uh, take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start at verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, or Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 13. And then while you guys are flipping there, I'm just going to uh, say my uh, message. The, the title of the message is, Have We Lost Our Savor? Have We Lost Our Savor? And uh, when you guys get there, I'll start, I'll start with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into it. Let's pray. Uh, dearly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for uh, letting me just be able to come here and uh, just preach your word and to um, uh, just be able, hopefully, to just bless uh, the people that are here that, that with what you've blessed me with, Lord. And please, um, when I preach, Lord, please to just uh, have you flowing out of me and, and none of my flesh just talking through, through me, Lord. And just please let everything go well with this message. I love you. Holy Christ's name I do pray. Amen. All righty. So, uh, have we lost our savor? So, if you guys are at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, I'll read it. Here we go. Verse 13 says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. And right here, um, right here in verse 13, it says, ye are the salt of the earth. And so when you think of salt, uh, when I think of salt, I, you know, I love food. I love to eat. Uh, for those of you guys who know me, I love eating a lot. And um, like uh, food, you know, obviously it has some salt to it. And when you, um, when you think of salt, you think of it in the aspect of food. You think of it as like a flavor enhancer, or you think of it as, you know, uh, you think of a taste when you think of salt. You think of all these different things. And also what salt is used for is to preserve. Salt is used as a preservative. Even if you go back to like ancient times where, you know, they didn't have a fridge or a freezer. I know, weird concept nowadays. It's kind of like, whoa, you guys didn't have fridges or freezers back then? Dude, that's crazy. But no, it was basically what they did to preserve. Since they didn't have fridges or freezers, they'd use salt. They'd get whatever they uh, wanted to eat. They'd like pack it up with salt, and then they'd leave it. Or yet, yeah, so they'd leave it, and it'd preserve. It'd preserve until the time they needed it to be prepared. And so uh, salt is also a preservative. And then right here, uh, when the Bible talks about ye are the salt of the earth, uh, Jesus, he's talking, he's talking to us Christians as the salt of the earth, we are to, um, in that aspect, we are more of, salt is, is being taught as more of an influence, being an influence, influencing something, more of a uh, 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 preserving from corruption. And um, as Christians, uh, we ought to be, you know, we ought to be the salt of the earth. We ought to try to preserve as many things as we can from corruption, from these things of this world. And... Well, that's why my title, Have We Lost Our Savor, uh, is kind of like a, it, it's, it's a, that's why I picked it, because a lot of us nowadays, you know, we say that we're Christians, we say that we believe in Christ, but, you know, there's a lot of us that aren't living like that, and when we don't live like that, our salt doesn't work. Our salt, basically, it loses that preservation aspect, and what it does is, it just corrodes, if I think that's the right word. It just corrodes, and then it leaves the thing that we were supposed to salt over, supposed to leave it corrupt. And um, whatchamacallit, let's see here, uh, supposed to corrupt. And then right here, what, point one, it says what it looks like when we lose our savor. In these verses, Christ is talking about how the believers are likened to salt due to the fact that we can influence. And so, you know, uh, in our church, we have different ministries, different roles, different uh, uh, patterns of leadership. And, you know, from pastor all the way down to, uh, you know, just the layman here, we all have some sort of influence and we all have some sort of way we're able to impact somebody else. And that really didn't, that really didn't uh, click in my brain as much until I started, <coughs> uh, to be honest, until I started going to Bible college because... When I went to Bible college, they, they kind of preach the same thing. It's like um, when you're doing things, remember you have other people that are watching you. 
And I'm always like, yeah, I understand that. You know, there's always going to be people watching me, you know. I understand that. But I didn't really grasp it until, like, later on in Bible college when I started realizing that the, um, the kids of our teachers, the teacher's kids or the principal's kids and just stuff like that, they come and they talk to you and they, they mention what they saw you do the other day. Or they mention that, hey, uh, we saw you on, like, Instagram or we saw you on Facebook the other day and just wanted to see how you're doing and stuff like that. It's kind of like, wow. I'm really like, I'm really getting like under a microscope almost. Like there's actually people here that uh, are watching me and making sure that I'm, you know, staying the course. And it's kind of, it's a very sobering thought because when you realize that it's not only just your life you have to worry about, but about others as well, it kind of changes how you think of as a whole. Like it just changes your perception. And not only that, if we lose our savor and if we lose our salt, if we lose the, our savor, um, then those influences that we're able to influence, those people that we're able to influence, we'll lose them too. And what happens when we lose them, the Bible says here, says in verse 13, I'll go back to that, ye are the salt of the earth, but the salt have, but if the salt hath, have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. And right here in that second half of the verse, second half of verse 13, where it says, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the, under the foot of men. So basically right there, it's, it's pretty strong language when you really think about it because Christ is saying, if you have no more influence to bear, if you have no more influence to share, or your influence is dying, or you're, yeah, you're just losing your influence, he's saying you're, you're the equivalent of just, like there's no there's no reason, like you're good, you're good for nothing, basically. And there's no reason that you should still be here, you should just be cast out. Like you're just as good as nothing if you have no influence, if you don't have an influence among uh, the people that uh, look up to you. And it's a very sobering thought. And also, <coughs> that other part, the next part where it says, and to be trodden under the foot of men. To be trodden under the foot of men. Now, I looked up this definition, the word trodden, and the, it is the past tense of the word tread. You know, when you think of tread, you think of, you know, walking around, you're treading, just treading through the field, treading, you know, just walking around. But this word trodden here is not only just the past tense of it, but the, the definition of it, it says to be, be crushed by being walked on. Crushed by being walked on. And I got to thinking, um where it says, and to be trodden under the foot of men, if we lose our influence and, you know, we're good for nothing, people are just, you know, the, this world, the, the influences of this world are going to be just walking over us. You know, they're going to be walking over us like we're nothing. And when they walk over us, you know, the world is going to, the world's going to uh, trodden over us. They're going to walk and they're going to crush us. They're going to walk and they're going to crush us. And when they crush us, they're going to have, it, it's, it's pretty crazy because when they crush us, they're going to have, you know, all the influences that we've had. And when they crush us by walking over us and they're crushing us, it just shows that the world has, you know, won. And the world has now that influence that you once had. And it's a very, a very uh, sobering thought because it's like, um, it shows how fast the world can seep through and just seep in through our, you know, ideologies or our, just our, just our church in general, you know, and there's so many people that, you know, that aren't in this, aren't in these pews anymore because, you know, they've lost their salt, they've lost their savor, and they've been trodden under the foot of men. And a good, a good um, story or a good verse or a good chapter, rather, if you guys turn to Genesis 19, Genesis 19, <coughs> This is a very powerful story with this, with this uh, verse right here and the meaning behind this verse. All righty. So if we go to verse, or yeah, verse 19, and we're going to start, we're going to start verse 19, verses 1, and we're going to read all to, all, uh, to verse 14. So let's read. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. 
and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, <coughs> pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he had made them a feast, and he did and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into, into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which, um, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came there under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. They said, and they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will, now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to, the break, to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house uh, with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, men said, said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And right there, Right there, especially verse 14, that's really like the kicker because Lot, as you can see, <coughs> Lot was a Christian, but he wasn't, he wasn't sharing his influences with his sons-in-law. He wasn't sharing his influences with, with the people that he knew or the people who he was close with. Rather, he was forming into the world's, uh, he was conforming to the world. And, and you can tell because in verse 14 where he's, where he's like it's an urgent, like it's a warning, like he's telling his family, he's literally telling his sons-in-law, hey, guys, look, they're going to destroy this place. We got to go and get out of here. And, and the Lord, you know, this, it says the Lord will destroy the city, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So picture this, okay? You just get a message that the place that you're staying at is going to be destroyed. And so you go and warn your family, your friends and your family about this and saying that God said, told me this and that, uh, that this place is going to be destroyed. We have to go. And it, you're, you know, you're very compassionate. You're, you're very, it's an urgent warning that you're wanting them to understand. But when they look at you, all they say is, or they look at you as one that mocked, of, that mocked what God said. And it's sad because his sons-in-law looked at him and they were like, they were, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to add words here, but they were, I'm thinking in my mind's eye, they were probably like, um, why are you, why are you saying this? Like, we, like, they don't, we don't believe you. Like, uh, you're, you know, you're, you say one thing and your actions portray another thing. And they're probably thinking that in their mind, like, wow, what a hypocrite, you know, like what's, why should I listen to him? He lives just as bad as me, like, if not worse. So why should I take advice from somebody who I might be even better than? And it's sad because that's, that's how a lot of Christians are nowadays, you know, that we, 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 um, we're not afraid uh, to share the gospel, but is our lives lining up to what we're sharing? And that's, you know, and when you start to realize that, it's pretty convicting. And it's crazy because it's, it's a lot of Christians out there. And I saw this quote, <clears throat> I saw this quote from Gandhi, and it was, uh, he says, he literally says, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians, because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. 
And when he said that, you know, and this was, you know, back then when, you know, Gandhi was, you know, in India and he was, you know, he was doing all these things. He was trying to, you know, liberate and all these things and just, um, and I believe he was, he was Hindu. I believe he was Hindu. And they were, you know, they were asking him questions like, why aren't you with the Christian faith? Uh, why did you decide to go with this religion? Why aren't you, you know, in the Christian faith? So on and so forth. And that was his, that was his rebuttal. That was his answer. And he literally said was because the people that say that they love that Christ truly don't love that Christ. And it's crazy because how, how bad is it that someone from another, from another religion, from another, you know, basically just from a cult is saying that about our relationship with God, saying that it's superficial, saying that we're, that we're hypocrites. That ought to, you know, that ought to put a fire within us. That ought to, like, really just get our blood burning because it's like, wow, like, you know, someone, that, that guy said that. And, you know, we have to reevaluate ourselves and realize what, you know, what you really are doing wrong. And let not that hinder you because there are so many people banking on your shoulders and so many people that look up to you that, you know, one foul swoop, one wrong move, that, you know, not just you going down to your ministry, but there's people that are looking, you know, up to you that fall down with you. And, you know, that's why being an influence is such a such an important thing, because, you know, we need more Christians. We need more strong Christians, more more strong Christians to stand up for the faith. And if we're out here, you know, being double minded and not doing what we're supposed to do, but have our Sunday morning best and our Wednesday morning or our Wednesday evening best, but just portraying that throughout church, but not portraying that throughout real life then we're doing something wrong. And, you know, the world, they can tell what a hypocrite is from just like that. And that's, that's a prime example of being trodden, just being, uh, being, in, being controlled now by the, word and by the world and being taken advantage of. And so let us not be like that. Let us be able to be that influence that, we need, that, um, that each other need. And so <clears throat> not only that, but or like I mentioned earlier, just... If we go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. All righty. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. All righty. Verse 13 uh, through 16. And uh, wherefore, gird up the loins, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And right here, just that, uh, verses 13 through 16 is a prime example of sanctification of sanctification and that you know once we get saved you know we're not uh once we get saved we're now we're positionally uh we can't be you know positionally when we're saved we're uh that's a positional truth when we get saved that's positional nothing's going to happen as the bible says the lord's holding on to you as strong as he can in his hand nothing's going to um take you away from that but we, our duty as Christians is to sanctify day by day, is to die to self. And if we don't die to self, then what happens is if uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, or verse 13, saying we'll be trodden under the foot of men. So we must sanctify ourselves each and every day. We must uh, die to ourselves. And, by, uh, and what you can do to do that is by reading your Bible, you know, doing your devotions, just praying and you know, doing all the things that the Bible requires us to do. And, you know, it's, it's a process, you know, from the youngest Christian here to the oldest Christian. It doesn't stop. And once you have that mentality of saying, you know, I think I've been saved long enough. I think, you know, I've got a good handle of this. I think we're good here. Then that's when, that's when you're at your weakest. That's when you're at your worst. Because then Christ, or not Christ, but then Satan can, um, take, um, can take advantage of that. And as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you hear that, if you read that verse, it doesn't say who he will devour. It says who he may. And it's kind of interesting because when you read that, it says who he may. It's saying who, uh, it's saying who is like leaving themselves open to it. 
who is the most vulnerable at this point? And it's kind of a sobering thought because it should, it should really just, um, it should really uh, make us more sober in that regard and to just make sure to keep our heads on a swivel. And, you know, it's, uh, it's just that, it's just crazy because there's so many Christians that are just going through, you know, life and they're thinking that they're doing what's right for God, but, you know, they're living two lives. And by doing that, you're not hurting your own testimony, you're hurting the other people around you. And, you know, as Christians th this afternoon, I'd like for us to, you know, take a challenge and just um, evaluate ourselves and to not only that, but just to um, realize that there are other people watching and we must do our best through Christ to not only be that good influence, but just to have that right testimony so that we won't be sending people straight to hell because of our hypocrisy. And um, let's end in a word of prayer. And thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this wonderful day, Lord. I thank you for the message you've given me. Uh, I thank you for um, just the opportunity I've had, Lord. And just I hope this message has uh, worked uh, uh, with uh, how you see fit, Lord. And just please bless today. And we love you. And your holy person, I do pray. Amen.